to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this um, passage of Scripture. Lord, thank you for your word. We rejoice, Lord, in the fact that Lord, we can come to you and praise you, pray to you, Lord, and treat you, Lord, lay our supplications at your feet, Lord, that we can worship you, that we can learn of you, Lord, that we can take your truth and live by it. God, thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you that it's a, a light into our path, a lamp into our feet. God, thank you, Lord, that it is authoritative, God, that it is the word of truth, that it is infallible, inerrant, or that we can trust you and trust it, Lord, and that by it, Lord, and through the work of your spirit, Lord, that we can be transformed uh, to live for you wholeheartedly. And God, thank you, Lord, that you work by your spirit to do that. And thank you for taking our hearts of stone, Lord, and replacing them with hearts of flesh and then sanctifying us, Lord, conforming us into the image of your Son. We pray, Lord, that you would do that now. Lord, please take these words, Lord, apply them to our heart and help us to live for you, God. And I pray that if anyone's here and that is not saved, Lord, that you would plow up the stony ground of their heart as Mark was saying, God, show them their condition, bring them to spiritual bankruptcy. And as you, Lord, have said, that you will raise up the humble. And we pray that you would do that even this morning. And we love you, Lord. This is for your name's sake, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may be seated. So we have been going through a series of sermons. Uh, the first part of the series was a heart for his church. And we talked about spiritual attitudes, and we've been talking about those spiritual attitudes that contribute to having a healthy, biblical, thriving church. It simply can't be just a matter of, of showing up and doing what you're supposed to do. Uh, it just can't be about that. That's simply moral conformity. That's doing it out of a sense of duty. And we've talked about before how anything, any act of kindness, any act of love is corrupted or somehow poisoned if it's merely looked at as just some external sense of duty. Uh, or just that you were supposed to, or that you ought to, or that you had to, uh, versus from the heart. Obedience to the Lord is always from the heart. And so first and foremost, we've got to have the right heart before the Lord. And that heart we've talked about comes from conversion, comes from being born again, having that heart of stone that you had in Adam before you came to Christ, broken up, dug out, and replaced with a heart of flesh, that soft, humble faithful heart the Lord gives you in genuine conversion. And that results in a radical transformation. You simply cannot be anything like the same when you've got that brand new heart and God's Spirit indwelling you. You're going to be a different person. Uh, all things have passed away. All th old things have passed away. All things have become new. You simply become a new creation in Christ. It's out of that heart that we serve the Lord. It's out of that heart that our motivation and drive comes for living for the Lord. It's out of a loving and grateful heart that we serve Him. But that necessitates, though, that we serve Him. And out of that kind of heart, the genuine disciple of Christ will obey. There's just certain fundamental aspects of a genuine disciple of Christ that lead to obedience. We've talked about faith uh, in this last section and how the fruit of faith is obedience to the Lord. You have faith as the root and obedience as the fruit. Faith and repentance, a repentance turning from sin and turning to the Lord, both end up in a submission to his lordship. End up with you, me, being a disciple of Christ. Not just a learner, but a learning follower of the Lord. Submitted to his lordship. And as a result... We talked about the fruit of humility 
and the fruit of hope. We mentioned joy, those heart disciplines, and how those heart disciplines pour over into how you live your life. And, and a Christian is simply going to be, going to look differently. And with that, then Christians are, by necessity, marked off. We're no longer of this world, in this world, for this world, and to this world. Christians are separated to God, for God, and to live for Him wholeheartedly. Nothing held back. No partial obedience. No half-hearted commitments will do. It's all or nothing when you come to follow Christ. And with that, we talked about there comes great responsibility. There's great responsibility for the person that says, I want to put down my life and I want to walk and follow Christ. I want to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow him. There's great responsibility that comes from that. And one of those responsibilities we'll see today is to be separate from the world. It's to be separate from the world. And I want to talk about this morning, we're going to talk about one of the very first things that flows from the right heart when we think about our responsibility to his church, because that's the next section we're into here, is our responsibility to his church. One of the very first things that flows out of that new heart and then becomes a responsibility that we have to him, to his church, to God's people, is the responsibility of love. And oftentimes we think of love as an emotion, or we think of love as just something we feel, or something that just, ah, just comes natural. Love is just easy. You don't have to think anything of it. You don't have to do anything about it. Most people think of love as a heart attitude, but love is a responsibility. Love is a responsibility to God. It's a responsibility to his people and his church. And we have to separate ourselves, mark ourselves off from the world when it comes to this particular responsibility. The world has vastly, wildly different conceptions of what genuine biblical love is or what true love is than what Christians do, than what God expresses in his word. And we're to separate from that. The church is to be separate and distinct. John 15, verses 18 and 19 says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. John 17, verses 14 to 16 Christ says again, I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. We're to be separate from the world, right? 1 John 2, verses 15 to 17, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Sounds like the world's definition of love, doesn't it? That's not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. And James 4.4, 4, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now, the world thinks of love in much the way sometimes that it thinks of God. The world thinks that it understands love in the same way that the world thinks oftentimes that it loves God and it simply does not. It hates God, hates everything to do with God, hates the biblical notion of what genuine love is, hates God. It simply does not understand love. Love, as, decide, as defined by Satan's world system... And then the love that is defined by truth, that's defined by God, are radically opposed to one another. And there's the constant need as a result of the Christian, the disciple, to be constantly renewing their mind with respect to a proper understanding of what love is. And the responsibility that we have to love one another and to love in Christ's church. We have to constantly be re redefining that because the world system is constantly de trying to define it for us. When you turn on your TV, you listen to music, you read a book, the entertainment system run by Satan, the world system run by Satan is constantly trying to redefine the biblical truth of what love is. And you have to swim against that current 
in the truth of God's word, constantly defining it rightly. Otherwise, you'll get swept away. And I'll challenge you today, we all have worldly conceptions of love that we struggle with, worldly conceptions of love that we have to dig out. And what's awful is that sometimes we don't see that. We are blinded to it. And it just takes saturation, submersion in God's word if we're to dig that out. In terms of the world, love primarily tends to be defined as sexual greed. Satan's replacement for love leads to fornication, adultery, homosexuality. These, this false sexual greed, this urge is so powerful that it almost, people are out of control. People are, the world is out of control with respect to the, the fruit that that leads to, the wicked, rotten fruit of adultery, fornication, homosexuality. They're steeped in self-indulgence, and it leads to violence, leads to murder. People are so obsessed, so obsessed with sex, that they rationalize the murder of society's most defenseless people for the sake of having it. And we're 50 million babies worldwide a year murdered in abortion. Abortion is the willingness to kill for your sex. You don't stop, you just kill instead. To call this a right is barbaric. And so when we're thinking about the election coming up, to call it an abortion right is barbaric. The vote against that nonsense. One out of three women will have one. One out of two people approve of it. And it demonstrates clearly the length to which someone will go for their own wicked self-indulgence. That's the world's conception of love. It's defined in terms of subjective emotions. Love is simply good feeling or sentimentalism. I feel good about this person, I love them. I don't feel good about them, I hate them. <laughs> it's just feeling. Uh, love is de uh, defined in the world in terms of tolerance and compromise. If you take a stand, you're intolerant and unloving. If you take a stand for Christianity, you're intolerant, unloving, ignorant. <laughs> Every adjective you can think of. If you're uncompromising, you're unloving. Compromise is the essence or the virtue of love. Is according to the world's definition. Everyone's true claims are equally valid except the Christians. Love is thought of as simple, natural. Love is over when it becomes difficult or seemingly unnatural, something you have to work at, something that no longer satisfies your self-indulgence. And love has more to do with simple self-gratification than anything else. And when you stop being gratified then you look for other objects of self-gratification to love. It gives very little and expects much. Today, love is the great justifier. You could get away with or do almost anything in the name of love. As long as the world considers, it's loving, considers it loving, it's okay to do. And consider for a moment what people today mean by or define love by when they talk about divorce. When you hear in the world people talking about divorce, what is their definition of love? Consider what we think about love or what people think about love when they use love to justify sex outside of marriage. Homosexual sex outside of marriage, what's their definition of love? What do they mean by love when they let their kids run amok? When they let them speak disrespectfully, when they behave rudely, when they let their kids date a lost person? What do they mean by love when their relationships are superficial, when they seldom let anyone in? Consider how love is defined when someone won't labor for peace or when they simply move from one church to the next. When they break one commitment and go ahead and make another commitment somewhere else, regardless of what area of their life it is. How is love defined when scripture is disregarded? And everywhere we see the utter failure of the world's definition of love, constant failure of commitments. And we see just simply the divorce rate is staggering. Not simply the divorce rate, the lack of marriage rate is staggering. The cohabitation rate is staggering. The statistics on sex outside of marriage are staggering. 
There simply is no commitment because people don't know how to love. They've got a worldly false idea of what love is. The world's definition of love leads to gross immorality, moral corruption. It's constantly taking and seldom, if ever, giving. There's insensitivity, glaring indifference. Truth is determined by feeling rather than by fact. Because of the world's definition of love, there's a deteriorating manhood. And we're, men are being continuously feminized based on the world's definition of love. A good man is somewhere in between a wet nurse and a figure skater nowadays, <laughs> as the world defines it. Anything that restrains or excludes is intolerant and therefore unloving. Now think about that in terms of the church. Anything that restrains or excludes or is intolerant is categorically unloving. In short, love, as defined by the world, is an idol that serves us. It's an idol. The definition of love, as the world knows it, and that we're constantly being corrupted by or assaulted by, that definition is simply an idol that serves us. And it's only love, as defined by the world, in the sense that I get to express it how and when I want to, with no restrictions, no binding, no commitment, and that it provides for fulfillment for me as I define it. Otherwise, it's unloving. Now, that overflows into the church, if you're not careful. That overflows into our thinking as a disciple of Christ. It certainly has overflowed into the church, the professing church as we know it. And how does this idolatry show up in the church? People that attend churches tend to think that the church is loving when they feel relaxed, entertained, comfortable, not judged, where you can believe what you want to believe, when you want to believe it, how you want to believe it, and live as you want to live. In other words, when they're focused on you. The church is loving when it's focused on you, the caring place, when it's focused on you. Someone else is loving when they make much of us. Or make us feel accepted, smart, encouraged, warm and fuzzy, attractive, empowered. In other words, when they're focused on us. God is love and his gospel is loving because it's all about me. As the song goes, like a rose trampled on the ground, you took the fall and thought of me above all. It's man-centered. Jesus and the church exist to make me feel more loved, more significant, more special. The church, Christ, the gospel, all exist to satisfy me. Sermons are to solve my problems, like some self-help speech so that I can be happy with myself, fulfilled with myself, so I can love myself more. Because of an idolatrous understanding of love, we view churches and people and the gospel preached like products that either satisfy us or don't. It's a consumeristic mindset. We're committed as long as we're satisfied. Right? Committed, committed to the church, committed to your brother and sister, committed to Christ, as long as you're satisfied. When that satisfaction ends, so does your commitment. When the going gets tough, we're not being satisfied, or things are inconvenient, or the relationship demands too much, we can no longer be committed and we find some rationalization for quickly dispensing of our commitment or any sense of obligation. Anything in the church that smacks of authority is categorically dismissed as unloving because authority is unloving. We all know that authority is abusive. Is that right? No. Abusive authority is abusive. Authority is set up by God. Anything that binds a person more than they want to be bound is dismissed as legalistic or rationalized again as unloving. As a result, then, the best way for a church to love and to reach the world is simply to come up with another product line. 
If the church and the gospel exist to satisfy the person, and we're all about church growth in the church today, then the thing for the church to do is simply come up with a better product line, a product line that attracts more people, that makes them feel more special. It tickles their ears. Churches, then, are simply no different than any other organization that vies for your attention. No different than the political party making phone calls, right? No different than the grocery store set up to attract your loyalty over time. It's simply another organization vying for your attention. And when it comes down to it, as a result, your commitment to church simply isn't that important. As soon as there's something else that will better satisfy your needs or wants or desires, you'll go there. As a result then, Christians so-called today, and we've got to be careful that this is not us, think about church, think about God's word, think about the gospel, even in terms of what serves them. They come to church thinking about what serves them, what's feeding them, what they're getting out of it. And Jonathan Lehman says, uh, they evaluate their experience rather than their hearts. They judge the church rather than letting the word of God judge them. They become their own shepherds, their own overseers. They become more concerned with the objects of love or the objects of their self-fulfillment rather than on the practice or discipline of loving. You see that switch? That's as Satan would have it. When people come to the church and they've got the world's conception of love, that everything is about them and everything is set up for the purpose of serving them, and they become the judge and arbiter and jury over what the church does or over how the church is structured or over how the church does things, and it becomes all about them, and they make that shift. Satan twists that in their mind to now no longer be what they're doing, the discipline or practice of loving another. Now, church and the gospel and the word of God is all about them and their objects of self-fulfillment rather than on the discipline or practice of actually loving someone else. And so they don't love, and they don't serve. And we've got to be careful that before we think that, okay, well, that's true, or that we see that, we've got to be thinking about that in terms of ourselves. How's that impacted our understanding of our role in Christ's church? When we think about love with respect to our responsibility to his church, do we have a conception of love that is worldly in the sense that we think that it's all about us, or what's in it for us, or what it's doing or not doing for us? We judge things based on us. We do exactly what I'm describing to one degree or another. And that's got to be dug out, dug out. Eventually, uh, Lehman goes on to say, people join churches lightly and they exit lightly. Since doing so does not violate their sense of love and its obligations. They don't stop to weigh the consequences of their departure on others. They don't feel the weight of their responsibility to others. They sometimes don't discuss the reasons for leaving with the pastor. They just go. They take their purchase back to the checkout counter. It's nothing personal. All in all, they ask little of others, and they give little in return. Pastors are no better. The average tenure of a pastor today in a church is 2.7 years. It's amazing, right? 2.7 years. It's like a, a year to start to get to know each other a little bit. A year for a few little problems to creep up and then 0.7 to move and get out of there. <laughs> it's like that's, there's no commitment. And what is involved in the practice or the obedience of love, and that's what we're talking about. Love is a responsibility. Love is a responsibility as church. There, love is to be practiced. It is a responsibility. It's a discipline that we are to perform and obedience that we're to perform ministering to one another in the church. And we have an example for that. Ephesians 5, 1 through 2 says, Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. 
We're to walk in love in the same manner as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us. We see that concept throughout Scripture. In Ephesians 5, speaking of the husband's love for the wife, it is to be sacrificial as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. That's love. Turn to John 13. Let's look at this together. This is an act of love on the part of Christ that is our example. It's to be our example, and as an example in Scripture, it's our command from Christ. In John 13, and look at verse 1. John 13, 1. I want you to think about this. Before this passage starts here, Luke 22 gives us a little bit of more insight as to what was happening at this point in time. Just prior to this act on the part of Christ toward his disciples, they were arguing over who would be the greatest. Jesus Christ has been telling them up to this point that he would go to Jerusalem and die, that he was going to his death. And they are quibbling over who's going to be the greatest. The indifference, the ugly indifference in that. And look at chapter 13 here in verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, he rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. This was customary. When you came into a room to eat, oftentimes uh, folks at this time ate reclined. They laid down, and you were often, your head was at near or at the level of someone else's feet. So if you can imagine traipsing through the Judean countryside uh, with sandals, open sandals, your feet get pretty dirty. And so dinner could turn into a really uncomfortable circumstance if this didn't take place. And so now they come into this room to eat, and they're reclined at the table. Now, ordinarily, foot washing was reserved for the, the lowest of the lowest of the servants in someone's house. It was that person that was responsible for washing the feet. Now, here, they're coming in, they're eating. Maybe they didn't have that person. There wasn't a slave around to do the washing. And here, for Christ to be the one that steps up to do this, obviously, the other disciples weren't going to or weren't. There was no one that just stepped up to do this, Christ stepped up to do this. So they're reclined. They've got dirt, dust all over their feet, stinky feet. They're about to eat dinner. And this is what Christ does. Christ puts himself into the position of that lowliest slave and does the thing that the lowliest slave would have been required to do. So he poured water into a basin, verse 5, and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. I mean, think about the humility. The condescension. This is the Lord of glory. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, What I'm doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. And Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only then, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you. Unless we think that this is somehow a, an impartation of grace or somehow salvific, this isn't. Um, Peter here is saved. He's clean Jesus Christ is exemplifying for him uh, a tremendous act of biblical, godly, Christ-exalting love. And it's a, an act that Peter and the disciples and we are to emulate. Look at verse 11. It says, Not all of you are clean, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet 
taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. In other words, as your Lord, if I have served you in this way, doing the very thing that the lowliest of the lowest slave would have been required to do, not even out of his heart desiring to do, and I'm your Lord and I've done this for you, then you go and do the same for your brother. It's not a precedent for practicing foot washing in the church, but it is a precedent for radical love, radical service to one another. It's a definition of biblical love. It's a definition of the love that Christ had that compelled himself out of love for the Father to give himself a ransom for many. It's that kind of love. Verse 15, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master. So, you disciples arguing over who is the greatest. You're not greater than your master. Your master is washing your feet. And think about it for a moment. Uh, Jesus Christ washed Judas's feet here. He washed Judas's feet too. This is regardless of how lovable or unlovable someone is. Christ simply did this act of love. The objects of our love have nothing to do with our service or responsibility of love. Make sense? We're to love, and we're to love as Christ loves, and we're to love as a responsibility to Him, to His church, uh, to each other. Verse 16, Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Look over at verse 31. John 13, 31. This kind of love is against every tide of love in the culture, against every worldly notion of love. Um, It's completely, radically different. Look at verse 31. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You'll seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, in this experience that he just gave them, this time they just had together, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, and it's by this kind of love, by this understanding of love, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. We need an infusion of this kind of love. We think about the wicked darkness that just envelops this wicked world. What shines forth as a light in that darkness? It's Christ's love. It's this kind of sacrificial love. You want to clean off the filth of this world's kind of love. You need to act out according to Christ's kind of love. And it's for the purpose that all will know. This kind of love demonstrates itself to a lost world so that all will know. Look at John 14, just one chapter over. Look down in verse 15. I want you to see here that... We're to practice this, and all of this is tied to Christ's holiness, to God's holiness. Look at chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, and we're getting a a lesson here on love from Christ. If you love me, verse 15, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Verse 19. A little while longer, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. At that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. 
He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Sounds conditional, doesn't it? If, if, if. Verse 24, he who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Flip over to chapter 15, one more chapter, verse 9. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. And you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. But this kind of love, all this to say, we look at John 13, into 14, into 15, and beyond, all of this kind of love is a demonstra- or this demonstration of love is tied to Christ's holiness, is tied to our holiness. If you love Christ, if you love God, then you're going to be holy, separated to God. Christians, then, it's required that Christians are marked off. It's not simply a, a giving of yourself. It's a giving yourself. Make sense? You're to be holy, separated to God. An idea of love apart from holiness is a false notion of love in terms of our love for Christ and his word. Holiness is tied to love. Holiness is like the pipe through which the water of love flows. It's the conduit for love. It's not, love is not the overarching, all-controlling attribute of God that controls everything else. God's holiness and God's glory. His own love for his glory, which he says he'll not share with another, it, that is the driving force through which the, an understanding of biblical love comes. It's tied to his holiness. And it requires that Christians are marked off, that they become separate from the world. And this has implications. Psalm 29.2 says, Give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And holiness is an act of love to God. I want you to see this. Colossians 3.12 says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies. That's not inconsequential there. Those two things are put together. It's the elect of God that are both holy and beloved. So what exactly is this relationship then? When we look at Scripture and we say, all right, if you say you know me, don't keep my commandments, you're a liar. Or by this, I'll know that you love me if you keep my commandments. Why do you say that you love me and you don't do the things that I say to do? It's because love, as it pertains to our responsibility to Christ and our responsibility to the church, is directly tied to God's holiness, Christ's holiness, and his understanding of holiness. Such that to be unholy is to be unloving. Holiness, if you think about it this way, is the measure of, of love's devotion to God. Holiness is the measure of love's devotion to God. How purely does God love God? Well, that's how holy God is. How purely does a man love God? Well, that's how holy a man is. See the connection? That's why when we read through the Bible, we don't find references to relationship. Everything today is about a relationship with God, relationship with Christ. I have a personal relationship. I remember talking to a guy one time, oh, witnessing at the door, and his 
answer to me was, I have a personal relationship with Christ. And his personal relationship with Christ was simply, he feels, feels like Christ is with him. Uh, I was going through a traffic light, and man, I just nearly missed that car. Christ was with me. Christ was with me, Christ was with me. And he lived like the devil. And that's his relationship with, yes, you have a relationship with Christ, and it's not one you're going to be thrilled to have when you stand before God on Judgment Day. When we look through Scripture, we don't see references to relationship. We see references to obedience, references to lordship. There is a relationship with God, and that relationship is completely asymmetrical. It's all weighted toward God's holiness, God's demands, God as Lord and Master, God as having the right to rule over us, to rule over you. And as such, our understanding of love is tied to whether we live a holy life or not. It's obedience, it's holiness, it's lordship. Therefore, and this is how it has implications, the church, that's what we're talking about, and you individually, as making up the body of Christ, as making up the church, we are to express our love and our worship of God through holiness, through holy living, through obedience, through submission to His Lordship, through service to the Lord. Can you see how completely radically opposed to the world's conception of love this is? It has absolutely nothing to do with you, <laughs> nothing to do with me. Everything to do with God's glory, with His holiness, with who He is. His character is reflected in the law, and the law dictates how we are to live all reflected in his holiness. Holiness, therefore, and love becomes very God-centered and not man-centered. Holiness, love, is God-centered. And as such, all of our service in the church should be acts of love toward God based on that holy life. To be simply a consumer is unloving toward God is unconcerned with his holiness, is unconcerned with the program of Christ and his gospel on the earth, to be unconcerned with lost people, hurt people, unconcerned with what Christ came to do. To fail to be serving in the church is unloving. To disobey with respect to Christ's commands in the church is unloving. It's all about loving through living a holy life, loving in the context of God's glory, in the context of His holiness. And as such, that's why it simply has nothing to do with living for yourself. It's completely and always a Godward focus. And it's simply to the degree that you don't serve the Lord in that way, it's the degree that you don't love Him. <laughs> that's why the Bible can say, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Why do you say you love me and do not do the things which I say? So if you're not pouring yourself out in love for others, in service, what is God's program on the earth right now? Evangelization of the lost. That's the mission of the church. If we're not pouring ourselves in obedience, pouring ourselves out in obedience to the Great Commission, it shows a lack of love for the lost and a lack of God, a love for God. We simply don't love him. Love looks like self-sacrifice. That's what we see here in the example of Christ. In John 13, 14, 15, 16, we have Christ as our example. And so now, what does love look like then? In terms of serving the Lord, in terms of living for Him, that's why it's not giving of yourself, it's a giving yourself. And that implication, giving yourself to Christ and his work in terms of our responsibility to his church, is to give yourself to Christ and his work through his ministry in the local church. It's the local church that stands to the world as Christ in his absence. And we are to love the Lord as a proper response to his holiness we're to love the Lord by giving ourselves to his work through the church. And this loving church will look a certain way. Flip over to John 17. We're just working our way through John here. Look at John 17. Verse 
Love looks like self-sacrifice, just like Christ was self-sacrificing. Submitted to the Father, just as Christ is, for the benefit of another, just like Christ did. Toward holiness for the praise, worship, and glory of God. Look at John 17, look at verse 9. And Christ says here, John 17, 9, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you've given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, they may be one as we are. This kept through his name there. They are marked off. They're marked off, separate and distinct from the world, bearing the name of Christ, bearing God's holy name, marked off. We talk about a good argument for church membership, well, that's it. A good argument for holy living, that's it. You're bearing the image of God, separate and distinct, marked off from the world. This is, there's a responsibility here. We're to be kept through his name. Reading on in verse 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept. None of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. And now look. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. You're going to be a loving church. You're going to be hated for it. Because a loving church being marked off from the world according to his name, according to holiness, will be despised and rejected, be reviled and persecuted. You think about it. This world's conception of love is tolerance and compromise and inclusivity. But God's conception of love is highly exclusive, <laughs> highly holy, <laughs> separate from the world and this world's system and Satan and all the wickedness of this world, completely exclusive to those that will not bow the knee and confess with their tongue the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as such, a loving church that will mark itself off from the world will be persecuted. And how is a loving church marked off from the world? Through high commitment in the church. Through a holy and a pure church. Through the practice of church discipline. When a church practices church discipline, the world's conception of love would say that is extremely unloving. But not to God's conception of love. God's conception of love is tied, bound in His holiness and as such, to be loving to the Lord, we must be holy. And we must have a holy and pure church. It's tied into His holiness. Look in verse 15. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. A loving church is to be a protected church. A church that is... With a shepherd using the rod and the staff is to be a church that keeps the wolves out at bay again this issue of church discipline look at verse 16 they are not of the world just as i am not of the world sanctify them by your truth your word is truth again 16 and 17 here were to be separate sanctified consecrated to the lord not a part of the world set apart we're to be consecrated for his service we're consecrated, as Scripture says, to love one another for the service of one another. We're to be consecrated to ministering to the Lord as a part of the church. We're consecrated for Him through holiness to evangelism. We're to be marked off and yet in the world. In the same way that Christ was separated to the Father and yet ate with tax collectors and sinners, we're to be in the world, not of the world. We're marked off, separate, holy, but we're here. And there's a reason that we're here, and that's to evangelize the lost, to, to share the gospel. This is not, again, a giving of yourself. It's a giving yourself. 
This is God's conception of love. It's bound up in His holy work, bound up in His holy name, bound up in His holy character that we're to be a reflection of in this world. And as such, it's our worldly definitions of love have nothing to do with this. So again, it goes back to this issue of now contemplating our responsibility to His church. How do we do this? When we think about marking the church off from the world, the church is marked off by holiness, by commitment to the Lord, by obedience to His commands. Therefore, the church has high commitment because this is not half-hearted commitment. It's not half-hearted or partial obedience. We're to be faithful in all things. And so a church is to be a church of high commitment. A church is to be a church that takes sin deathly seriously and deals with sin, that doesn't tolerate sin. A church is to be loving toward one another, sacrificially loving, without being compromising with sin or with God's holiness or God's character. As such, we're to be submitted to God in the church. The church is marked off. When the church is marked off, church is marked off by a proper understanding of membership, a proper understanding of what we're committing to, so that we don't have the consumerism mindset of the world. We've got God's conception of commitment and holiness and obedience and living out the commands of Christ. And as such, a necessity to remain marked off is church discipline. Can you see how church membership, high commitment, holy living, uncompromising, and church discipline are expressions of God's definition of love? The only way that Christ's testimony in this world is preserved is through the separateness of Christ's people from the world. If you are of the world or look like the world or behave the wor like the world, you come into the church today and it smacks of the world, and that, uh, goes, that flies in the face of God's character, of His holiness, flies in the face of Christ's sacrifice, and you're no longer a light to the world. You're simply another part of it. You're simply reflecting the world's notions of what love is not reflecting God's truth about what love is. So submission to the revealed will of God through the church is an act of love on your part and on my part. We have a responsibility to love in Christ's church the way that he designed, designed it to be and defined it to be. And through that is obedience, is sacrifice, is high commitment. In the church, first line of defense, we talked about attitudes of the heart, and we talked about faith, we talked about humility, and out of that faith, out of that humility, out of that bankrupt spirit flows repentance and just the fruit of obedience to the Lord. That flows into our responsibility to the church. God is holy, and His church is holy. His church is a light set on a hill. We, as God's people, out of that heart, simply obey Him. And so that obedience to the Lord in His church reflect His character. The law reflects His character. We obey His commands reflecting His character. We bear His name reflecting His character. When the church stops doing that, the church is lost. And the church's testimony in the world is lost. And we simply become like every other godless so-called church. We have to maintain holiness in the church. Now that comes with a binding commitment. How is the church marked off? The church is marked off by binding commitment. We all are the called of God. If you're a disciple of Christ, you've been called by God, effectually called by God to Him, to live for Him wholeheartedly. That is a binding commitment. He who perseveres to the end will be saved. The church is to be made up of disciples who make binding commitments, long-term, lifelong binding commitments to the Lord. And in that binding commitment, there is a submission to authority, God-ordained authority. We're all under authority 
And that's the way the church maintains its separateness from the world. Authority says, let's serve the Lord and fully obey his commands and get the gospel out. Submission says, I'll help. <laughs> right? And that's the way the church operates. The Lord gives the commands to the church. The church has a mission to fulfill. Authority says, here's the mission. And we have that authority from God's word. Here's the mission. Here's what we're all about. Here's what we're going to get out and do. And submission says, I'm going to do it. I'm going to help. And as such, the mission of the church, the submission of God's people, the obedience, the love acted out toward the holiness of God, and the church accomplishes the mission that God gives it to do. The world's conception of love completely flies in the face of that. And if we allow the world's conception of love to infiltrate our thinking, then binding commitment is unloving. What is there loving about binding commitment? Well, why aren't people committed? It's because they think there's going to be some better thing to commit to down the road, and they don't want to miss out. <laughs> when you married your wife, when you married your husband, you made a binding commitment long term. With some commitments, you sacrifice initial good for the sake of long term good. That's what Christians do. When you come to Christ, it is a sacrifice of your initial pleasures, your initial self-will, your initial self-desires for the long-term desire of serving and loving Christ forever. In his church, the same thing holds true. We make commitments. We make binding commitments. We separate ourselves from the world, separate ourselves to him and to his people in order to sacrifice, to live holy, express God's love through that holiness and that separateness to a lost world so that we become effective testimonies of Christ and his goodness and his mercy. Without that, that testimony is lost. And we see that by and large in churches all over the place. The testimony of Christ is simply lost, and it's become one more dinner and a show, right? That's not what the church is to be. That idea of love has to be reworked. And when we look at love specifically now in terms of the church, our love to Christ's church, in the same way that our love to Christ is expressed in obedience to his commands, because our love is tied up in his holiness, in the same way our service to the Lord, our love for God's people is tied up in obedience to his commands, is tied up in holiness. And that's the way we're to love our brother. If you listen to all of that, none of that is self-indulgent, right? Now, both go hand in hand. When you love that way, does it feel good? <laughs> yes. When you love that way, that's very self-fulfilling. It's like, man, I love my brother. Oh, I just feel better. <laughs> you know, it's like... So yeah, the Lord blesses through that. In the same way when you evangelize, you share the gospel with a lost person, wow, that gospel went out, that lost person had the opportunity to hear the words of God, the words of salvation, but at the same time, the Lord blesses you through it. When you love sacrificially that way, when you're thinking of your brother, you're thinking of his church, you're thinking of ministering to him, then the Lord blesses you too. But there's no self-indulgence, self-will in God's definition of love. God's definition of love is entirely about His glory, about His holiness, about obedience to His commands, about service in the church. So you, do you really love God? I mean, do you love God? We looked at earlier, a man loves God that's measured by His holiness. That's why you can say a man who is unholy hates God. A man living a holy life loves God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to, to go through these passages, Lord, to look at these various aspects, Lord, of your church and what your church is to be. Lord, and we acknowledge and admit, Lord, that we are often swayed away or swept up in this world uh, in which we are simply aliens, sojourners, or sometimes we can get our minds tangled up with uh, misrepresentations, misunderstandings, just uh, 
the wicked definitions of this world. Lord, help us to think clearly. Help us to think according to your word. Lord, we see the example of Christ in his love for you demonstrated in him doing all that you've commanded. Lord, and we, we want to follow his example. Lord, we want to love in that way. Lord, help us to repent of sin, God. We repent before you. Repent before you, Lord, of our selfish motives, our selfish ambition, our selfish lusts, and our flesh desires, Lord, that wage war against the Spirit. Lord, and we repent of that, Lord, and, and desperately, Lord, want to set it down, to drop it, Lord, so that we can move on toward greater and greater service and love to you. Lord, empower us by your Spirit to love you that way, to zealously obey you, to zealously live for you, God, to zealously minister to the Lord through your instrument, the local church. Again, for your namesake, Lord, to, so that we would be a God-glorifying testimony to a lost world, Lord, that others would be saved, that you would be glorified. Ultimately, Lord, we know it's about your glory, and it's right that every person would worship you and praise you, Lord, would be reflections of your glory. So help us, Lord, in this. Help us to understand love uh, in the church as it is intended to be, you know, sacrificial. Um, Lord, not that we would become judges of what satisfies us, or that we would be completely Godward focused, God centered, not man centered, you know, for your name's sake, Lord, and for the testimony of your name to the nations. We love you, Lord. Thank you for all this, this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Strung down but not destroyed